Matthew chapter 28. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, we're not going to go through this in a thorough manner. If I were teaching this on a Sunday, I'd be taking a lot of time to develop a lot of things because there are quite a number of things I will not be touching on tonight. But I want to give to you enough information to help you understand a little bit about water baptism. I want to begin by pointing a couple of things out here. And I'm going to develop something for you as I do so. But I want you to notice something that's pretty, pretty obvious if you were to take the entire context of Matthew uh, into consideration as you look at verse 16. I want you to notice as we begin how it simply says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. The 11 disciples. As we begin, notice there are no longer 12. 12 apostles. The fact is all began the race, but not all finished. One of the marks of a disciple, one of the marks of being a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, I would say it's a first mark, at least found here in uh, Matthew, and I want to give you a few marks of disciples, if you will. One of the first evidences, the first mark, would be to persevere. All had begun the race, but not all finished. Judas is no longer counted as one of the twelve, and instead of being mentioned at all, he simply omitted from the number. And that's why Matthew says, then the 11 disciples. When he says the 11 disciples, the disciples is in reference to the apostles. And so all began the race. Jesus had appointed 12. All began with him, but not all finished with him. So it's not just the beginning, it's a continuing and concluding. So one of the marks of a disciple one of the ways that you know that you are genuine is the simple perseverance, holding fast to the very end. Many run a race, but not all finish it. Not all people run the race lawfully. Some are disqualified. When, when Paul was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, he said it like this, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? He goes on to say, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And so one of the marks that you are genuinely a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is that you hold fast to the end. That's what disciples do. We don't begin and then just drop out. We may stumble at times. We will have difficulties at times. We don't always run in the direction that we'd like to. Sometimes we may veer to one side or the other. We're obviously commanded by God not to do so, but our flesh sometimes is so great the temptations can be so difficult that we can yield. But we get back into the race. We get back into the race. And so one of the things we know here is that Judas began, but Judas didn't finish. One of the marks of a disciple is not only do we begin that race, we continue that race and we finish. And so that's the first thing I wanted to observe. Judas is no longer counted as one of the twelve. He simply omitted from the number. Now, as we look at this passage in verse 16 again, it says, the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, notice, to the mountain. Galilee is to the north. When you look at the nation of Israel on a map, you can look and see in the northern region, it's called the Galilee. The southern region is, uh, is Judah and, and that which is south of it. And normally when you're looking at your New Testament and you're looking at the Gospels, it will speak of events that took place around Jerusalem or events that took uh, place around the Sea of Galilee. And so what we find here is that the 11 apostles went to Galilee. But notice it says, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed to them. Now Jesus had promised to meet them in Galilee. In Matthew 20, 26, 32, Jesus had said, but after I have been raised, 
I will go before you to Galilee. So he had said, after my resurrection, I'm going to go before you into the north. In uh, chapter 28, verses 7 and 10, that is basically repeated. So apparently Jesus had not only stated that he would be in Galilee, but he also had a place picked out for them to meet him. Now, when you spend time looking at your Bible in your New Testament, Jesus often ministered to them on sites that are referred to as a mountainside or a mountain. Um, for example, a, a mountainside is where he gave the greatest message that it was ever given. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's also on a mountain that he chose his 12 disciples. Mark 3.13 said Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. You see a mountain uh, involved in the feeding of the 5,000 because this took place at the foot of a mountain, according to John chapter 6. The transfiguration event occurred on a mountain in Matthew chapter 17. The Bible tells us he wept over Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. We know that he gave what is called the Mount of Olives Discourse in Matthew 24. We know that at his ascension that Jesus Christ actually ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives, according to Acts chapter 1. Here, a mountain is being referred to where he gives what is called the Great Commission. And so he calls them, and he had told them, I will go before you and I will meet you at this particular location. So a second thing I want to point out about being a disciple, one is you persevere, and two is Second, the second one would be simply obedience, that you are obedient to him. This is simple obedience. Simple obedience places him in a position of usability. It's been said, ability is not as important as availability. And so one of the things that disciples learn, and this is, this is so basic, all of us know it, but I want to reiterate it. One of the things that you will learn, and I could give a, a longer message on this, and I'm beginning to think of things, and I'm going to have to tell myself, please don't go there, just say the things you prepared. Because as I'm looking at this, my mind starts kind of going, and you know what? It's telling me, say this, but I'm saying, no, I will not. Well, I'll say a little bit. I was thinking about it. What is the mark of a disciple? One, a disciple perseveres. Two, simple obedience. How do I know what to obey? Do I, I obey my feelings? Do I obey what people feel that I should obey? What I obey is the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it's not as simple in terms of its complexity as it sounds when you say it. It's actually very deep when you say that you follow the word and you follow the leading of the Spirit. That's actually a very deep concept. It's not a lightweight thing. There are a lot of people who say, oh yeah, I understand that I do that, when in reality they really don't, for a very basic reason. One, is they're constantly quenching the Holy Spirit in their life, and two, they don't read the Bible. And yet when you speak to them, they'll say, oh yeah, I follow the leading of the Spirit, when in reality what they're saying is, I, I follow the impulses that I might have, the thoughts that I have, or the feelings that I have, and so it takes a while and takes some maturity for us to be able to rightly divide the Word of God. In other words, to take the passage of Scripture in its context, to understand what was its purpose and what it intends to say, and then to put that into practice. Simple obedience really rests on rightly dividing the Word of God and obeying what God's Word has to say. And when you do that, when you simply obey even what seems to be the most simple things, the basic things, God meets you in a very special way. Turn with me for a moment, please. I'm going to make you exercise by... Turn to John chapter 14 for a moment. I want to illustrate from Scripture. John chapter 14. In verse 21... In verse 21 of John chapter 14, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, 
and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Now, in verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What is one of the ways that you demonstrate your love for God? What did Jesus say? You'll keep his word. What you're doing tonight, those of you who are being baptized, is you're keeping his word. Jesus said to go and baptize disciples. You, in obedience to that, are demonstrating that even the simple command of being baptized is something that you desire. And I like to tell people that when you're water baptized, it is one of those moments in your life that you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, can experience the joy of obedience because God has said, go out and be baptized. And so it's one of those moments in your life when you're water baptized that God will meet you in a very, very special way. Turn it on back to Matthew chapter 28. Obedience is a mark of a disciple. Simple obedience, go and I'll meet you. And he does. Now they're there at this place he called them to. And in verse 17, continuing, it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, some doubted. So a third thing about being a disciple, one is you persevere, two, you obey, three, you worship. When they saw him, they worshiped. The moment Jesus appeared, his disciples began to worship him. It's interesting how it says some doubted. Perhaps they could not see him clearly. Maybe it was a distance, and at first they didn't know for sure that it was him. But we need to remember that only the apostles and a few of the women had seen Jesus alive, and so it would have been a little bit difficult for them to really grasp what was taking place, many of them. And yet, a third mark is that you worship the Lord. I've been sharing on uh, Wednesday night in uh, our Revelation study how that uh, worship, and we've been looking at worship out of uh, chapter 6 and 7, and um, just this last week, uh, it, it says in Revelation uh, chapter 7 that, that heaven, and, and this is, it was uh, kind of amazing to some people, I'm sure, the first time you've ever seen this, that heaven is actually a loud place. Uh, some people have this idea that heaven is a very quiet place, that people kind of sit around kind of muttering under their breath or whatever. That's not the picture that you get when you're looking at worship in heaven. Worship in heaven is loud, and it says so. And there are millions upon millions who are shouting praise to God. And they're falling on their faces before the Lord. And I've been sharing on Wednesday night. I'm not going to ask you to start shouting, and I'm not going to ask you to start falling all over on the, on, the, on the ground with your faces smashed against the carpet. And I'm, I'm not saying that. But I've been saying that if you think that worship is quiet, you're wrong. Worship is with all of your soul, it's all, it's all that's within you. You know, I've seen some people really get into some secular songs and they scream at the top of their lungs and they're really going for it. I think some of the funny times I've had is when I've seen somebody in a car next to me who's playing music, obviously, that they like and they're just swinging their heads around and singing like crazy people there. You can't hear them, thank God, but they're really going for it, right? Years ago, here in this church, when we used to meet in um, Ontario, we uh, had a very small uh, auditorium, and our speakers were stand-up, stand-alone speakers, and they were in the front of the stage. And if I stepped off the steps, it was only like two steps, and I was on the floor, and if I took two steps, I'd be in the front row. That's how small the place was. Uh, the the platform was so short that if I had somebody over six foot six, it's possible that if they stood on their tiptoes, they could hit the ceiling. That's how small the place was. And I can remember I had a brother that came to teach that I was afraid he was going to get stuck on the ceiling. He was really tall. And, but the music's always been a little loud. We've had people in the past say, can you turn it down a little bit? And the answer is no. But we had a, an 80-something-year-old lady who used to sit in the front row, 80-something. And the music was a little loud, so I spoke to her grandson. His name was Steve. I said, Steve, your grandma's 
seated in the front row and the music kind of loud. I said, doesn't it hurt her ears? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, no, she just turns her hearing aid down. It doesn't bother her at all. Heaven is filled with loud worship and praise. One of the elements of your life, one of the things that marks you as a disciple, very simply put, is you're a worshiper. And when these people saw Jesus Christ, they worshiped him. When they saw him, the Bible says they worshiped. Now, as this is taking place, and we'll move into and close, Jesus, verse 18, came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus comes, he speaks to them, and notice he says, all authority has been given to me. And as he speaks concerning this authority that has been given to him, he gives them a commission. He says, go, in verse 19, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations. We need to remember that in Judaism, in the, the Jewish religious system, the temple was the central place of all worship. That, that the Jews would actually gather together. Males were mandated uh, above a certain age, if, it's, if they're capable of being there, three times a year to assemble in Jerusalem. It was the place to worship God. But after the resurrection, the temple of God is now to go out to the people. And the temple of God is not just going to the Jewish nation, but the temple of God is to go out throughout the world, and there's a mission, and that's what he's saying. He's saying to teach all nations, literally to make disciples. And so the commission, when he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. When you look at this, and this is something else for us to see tonight, is he's saying to go. Now, many times people will say that in the Great Commission, that's what you're looking at right now in verse 19, that the command or the main verb would be go. And so they'll say that's what you're to do. You're supposed to go, and then you can have missions conferences that are really built on going. And so you'll have missionaries who gather, and they'll say, you need to go, you need to go. Jesus said go. But I want you to note something. The main verb here, and it's very important for me to point this out to you, the main verb here is not the word go. The main verb is to make disciples. What Jesus is saying here literally is this. You are going to leave this place. The Holy Spirit is going to baptize you. You are going to leave this place, but you have a commission. The commission that you have is to make disciples. It's not just leaving. It's going out with this word, teaching them, he said, to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the commission. The commission of the body of Christ is to go out and to teach the world about Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that you will come to this church and you'll get a verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Word of God is that's what Jesus taught us to do. And that's what disciples do, is you get into the Word of God. You're not one of these people who just get up in the morning and say, well, I've heard that I ought to have something called morning morning devotions. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe it just means that I should just trust the Lord to give me something for the day. And there are some people who will open their Bible and just put their finger down and say, okay, what do you have for me today? That's called bibliomancy. And it's not proper. But that's what they'll do. And so they'll put their hand down there. And that, there can be danger in that because they may put their hand down like someone one time did. What, what do you have for me today? And they put their hand down and said, Judas went out and hanged himself. And they said, oh boy, that, that can't be for me. I'll have to ask the Lord. God, are you sure that's what you want? And then they swing the Bible open, go out and do the same. Oh, no, you know. <laughs> and so Jesus taught us to go out, he said, make disciples of all nations. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And so part of being a disciple is to share your faith as you've been equipped to do so. What is it that the world needs today? Well, I believe very strongly that the world needs today, amongst many things, the world needs today people who are willing to go out and share what Jesus has done. And that's what God has called us to do. Now, as you make disciples, 
This is what we'll look at, and we'll get to this now. He says, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6, and I'll give you a few thoughts, and then we'll go out to the pool and practice what we're preaching. Baptizing them. The outside or outer emblem of being born again is baptism. It's immersion in water. The immersion in water symbolizes your death and resurrection in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism represents our understanding of this. We are baptized in order to be visibly identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. We are not baptized in order to join a church. We're baptized because we're right with God. We're not baptized in order to be saved because baptism is not necessary for salvation. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 said it like this. He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So baptism isn't necessary for salvation, but it does demonstrate that you have been saved, and it's an act of obedience when you follow the Lord in baptism. Baptism is a picture of identification. It's a picture of our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism represents our new life in Jesus Christ, and it represents us taking on a newness in the Lord. The word baptize is the word baptizo in Greek. It means to dip or immerse. It speaks of plunging under. It was originally used in reference to dyeing a cloth. So baptism is a visible demonstration of salvation and identification with Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Paul said it like this, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And so we're baptized, we're identifying. When you step into the pool in a moment and you enter into the water, you're going to walk up to one of us. We're, there are going to be several of us that are circling the pool there. And I'm going to ask you to go to the person who hasn't anybody there with them. Sometimes people say, well, I want that person to baptize me. And if it opens up that that's possible, that's great. If it doesn't, that's great too. You're being water baptized. But I'll ask you to go to that person. When you walk up to that person, they're going to ask you what's your name. And you'll give them your name. And uh, they'll pray for you. And um, sometimes people will come with their family. There are times that I've baptized two or three people, four people at the same time where they'll hold hands and uh, the whole family will be baptized. It's beautiful when that happens. Sometimes people will not walk in. I should say this while I'm uh, speaking about this. Sometimes people cannot climb the ladder. Sometimes they have physical inability to go into the water. They can't be water baptized by climbing into the pool. And so if you're of that stripe, if that's your situation right now, you just can't get into the water, but you want to be baptized, all you need to do is speak to one of the ushers who will be right there. They'll let one of us know, and we'll go to the side of the pool where you're at, and we'll just cup some water in our hand, and we'll just pour it on you. Now, that's okay. I baptized my father in my bathtub at home. And it's okay. The Lord didn't say to him, were you baptized in the Jordan? Were you baptized in a pool? No, I was baptized in a bathtub. Sorry, go to hell. He's not going to do that. <laughs> you know, because it's not the water that cleanses you. It's the blood of Christ. Keep that in mind. And it's okay. Now, I would prefer, and most of us would, because the word immerse, uh, baptized speaks of immersion, and that's why we immerse. And, but it's okay to be water baptized with just a sprinkling of water also, because it's a symbol of what took place in your life. And so some of you may want to do that. Now, when you're standing with me or one of us, uh, we will say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you go down into the water, that is a picture of death and burial. 
When you come out of the water, that is a picture of resurrection to new life. So you are baptized in the name of Jesus. I am dead in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And that's the picture. It's called an enacted drama. It's, it's something that you're actually enacted parable. It's a drama that enables you to portray visually what has taken place spiritually. And that's why baptism is such a beautiful thing. It's because when you step in the water, you're saying to everybody around you, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. When you step into that water and you go under, you're saying, I am dead and I am buried. When you come out of that water, you say, and I'm alive in Jesus Christ. There's something about entering into that water that typifies death that has a very powerful message. I've shared this, and I share this most every time I do a baptism here in the church. Some of you have heard me say this before. When my grandmother went to be with the Lord, my dad and I were standing in the front of the, of the um, chapel, and my dad was very stoic. My dad was a strong man. This is his mama. His mama has died a few days away from his birthday and close to her own birthday. She was, I believe, 92 years old. And I was standing shoulder to shoulder with my father, and there was the coffin of my grandmother, a little four foot ten woman in this casket. My dad and I are standing, and I was very close to my father, and we're standing there, and I still remember the conversation we had when my father says, look at her hands, David. My grandma had real arthritic hands. They were all gnarled from, from just arthritis and, and age. And he said to me, See those hands? I said, yes, I do. They made a lot of tortillas. <laughs> I, said, I said, I remember, Daddy. Because we would go to my grandma's on Saturdays, and Grandma always had fresh tortillas for us. I said, I remember, Daddy. And he said, she used them on my head more than once. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure she did. But my father was just real quiet. He was one of these quiet men. And so they close the casket, they take her to the grave site. I'm standing next to my father. And as we stand there, they lower the casket. Everybody has pretty much left except my dad and me. Everybody has disappeared, but dad wanted to remain just a moment longer. And here comes this, this little bulldozer. And as I'm standing next to my dad, they take the dirt that had been piled up there at the side of the grave and they shoved the dirt on top of the casket of my grandmother. And it was at that moment that I heard my father sob. He just lost it. I heard him just sob. Why? Because for my dad, the dirt covering that coffin, it's over. He saw that. It's over. My mama's gone. When you go into that water, and you go underneath it, you are dead. Your old man, that sinful man, is dead and buried in Jesus Christ. But when you come out, that's newness of life. And that's something that ought to cause us great joy because we're alive in Christ, dead to sin, and alive in him. And that's what the emblem is. That's what the picture is. We go under the water, we're identified with his death, his burial. We come out of the water, and we are raised. It's a picture of being raised by the, uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father. And we are reminded that we are united together in the likeness of his death. But we are also looking forward to the life that we have because of the Spirit. Jesus had said, Behold, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age until I come to judge the world until I come to rule on earth I want you to remember I will be with you so even now he was telling his disciples as you go while you go where you go make disciples and as you make these disciples I want to remind you I will be with you